So good afternoon to all of you. Um, that is the second um, high-level policy session. And we're going to discuss Capital Market Union, CMU. So this morning was about banking union. This afternoon is about Capital Market Union. And uh, the um, two speeches by the uh, commissioner and the uh, vice president were, uh, I think, very good transitions from one uh, domain uh, to the other. Um, a lot has been said already on Capital Market Union since the, f since the um, term was coined, I guess, what, three years ago, maybe, uh, just in the wake of the um, banking union decisions. Um, a lot of thought had, begin had been given to both the, the theory of it and the uh, practice of it, uh, starting with the uh, commission, obviously. So we'll, uh, we've uh, heard the commissioner, and in a second we'll hear what uh, John has to say about the next steps uh, in uh, implementing a capital market union, also on the ECB side, and uh, uh, clearly the uh, report um, uh, we're publishing today uh, is, uh, is part of it. It's just the late latest example of it. Uh, but also uh, on the academic side and uh, on the part of the uh, industry. So we now have a more, much uh, clearer vision of uh, what are the challenges, what are the issues, uh, what are the steps, in which order, the sequence, uh, what's easier, what's less easy. And I hope this, uh, all this uh, accumulated uh, wisdom uh, will, uh, will, um, uh, will um, uh, fuel uh, our discussion. Um, so why, um, why is the ECB uh, interested in capital market union? You've heard the, the vice president uh, explaining uh, why it's important also uh, from a monetary union uh, standpoint. Uh, what I would like to uh, add to that, consistent with what he said, but to, 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 uh, to cover the whole field of what we're going to discuss in this uh, panel, is that um, certainly uh, one way to look at capital market union is as a complement um, to banking union, or as a, um, a twin uh, sister or brother to capital to, to banking union, uh, uh, complementary to banking union, uh, uh, in, uh, aiming at improving resilience uh, by providing different kinds of, uh, of, uh, of uh, financing channels and different instruments and different institutions being part of it. So it, it is clearly a complement to banking union, uh, but it's also it's more than that. Um, it is also uh, about completing the single market. So it is just a, uh, another uh, block built on uh, the uh, long-standing process of uh, completing the single market in capital and financial services. And many of the discussions we're having today as part of CMU are in fact just new uh, versions uh, of discussions uh, we've known very well, uh, the uh, Giovannini uh, barriers uh, and the like, which have been around for uh, many, many years. So, uh, <laughs> don't look desperate, John, you're, you're, you'll make it, you'll make it. Um, so, um, it's, uh, it's also about completing the single market in capital, so it's about the single market, um, and it's also about strengthening the, the economic and monetary union, as the Vice President explained. Uh, that's about uh, providing uh, new uh, risk-sharing channels uh, in the um, uh, economic and monetary union, which will complement the existing ones, and. Um, in um, hopefully also uh, uh, the, uh, the more risk sharing through decentralized markets, through private markets, also the less risk sharing will be needed through uh, public intervention. So in a sense, to put it in a, in a, in a sim simplified way and in a, in a simplistic way, uh, the more capital market union, the less need for a fiscal union. Because a lot of what we want to achieve through, the, through a fiscal union can be achieved uh, through decentralized mechanisms by providing a better resilience to shocks in market. Uh, so it has, it has much broader benefits than uh, the, uh, the, uh, the pure capital market dimension. Uh, the less uh, uh, serious we are about capital market union, in a sense, the less we, uh, we need to discuss um, a fiscal union. Which is also a, a political answer to all those who uh, fear the uh, political cost and political difficulty of some of the uh, ramifications of capital market union, and we're going to discuss it uh, insolvency law is a formidable uh, discussion, very difficult in many countries. Um, uh, tax harmonization would be even more difficult, uh, uh, but it has something to do also with capital market union, etc. All of this is ex extraordinarily difficult politically, but think of, think of the alternative. If we don't do capital market union, we'll have to jump straight 
directly to a, a discussion on, on fiscal union, which will be uh, even more for formidable from a political standpoint. So that's our message also to the uh, political authorities, of which we are not, uh, that if they fear that discussion, uh, beware uh, the alternative, which would be to, to have to be serious about fiscal union. So better focus on that part of the discussion. So I think I will stop here. I just wanted to uh, tease you and uh, uh, raise the um, raise the uh, the, uh, the bar in terms of the uh, what we expect from our participants. So I'm very glad to have here uh, a very diverse and uh, and also formidable. I said the challenges were formidable, but the uh, respondents are also formidable. So uh, we have five uh, speakers um, who will uh, introduce that discussion by alphabetical order. So we'll start with John uh, Berrigan, who's the Deputy Director General uh, in DG um, uh, FISMA in the European Commission. We'll then move to uh, David uh, Folkerslando, who's the Chief Economist and Head of Research uh, at the uh, Deutsche Bank. And then uh, Guillaume Prash is the Managing Director at uh, Better Finance. Um, and we'll bring the uh, investors and users uh, angle into the discussion. Uh, Hauke Stars is a member of the Executive Board of Deutsche Börse. She has a lot to tell us about uh, capital market union in practice, and in particular uh, on, uh, when it comes to uh, growth uh, 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 industries and uh, SMEs and uh, everything we want to particularly uh, uh, spur and develop through capital market union. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Rick Watson is the managing director of uh, AFMI, the Association for Financial Markets in Europe. So we cover the broad uh, range of stakeholders in that discussion. And without due delay, uh, I give the floor to John. Okay. Thank you, Benoit. Um, okay, I would like to, in my introductory remarks, pick up on some themes that Victor uh, mentioned in his, um, and you, you have echoed in your comments, and Victor raised in his speech. So I'd like to start by looking at this evolving rationale for CMU, then talk a little bit about the strategy and address this issue of ambitious CMU versus not ambitious CMU. Then I will make a few comments on the status report. I promise not to give you a long list of achievements. The commissioner did not do this morning. I will take my cue from him. And then if I have time, I will approach some of these more fundamental issues that Victor raised about insolvency frameworks, securities, holders, rights, taxation. If I don't have time, I'm sure I'll get a chance to come back in, in the Q&A. So I will try to be disciplined. In terms of rationale, um, I think it's important to remember that CMU is not entirely new. It's a, it's a resumption of efforts to integrate EU capital markets that predated the crisis. To some extent, this effort was cut short by the banking crisis in 2007, 2008, and we're now returning to that after the crisis in the banking has at least been put through its acute phase and has not claimed or through all phases of that crisis. The rationale, of course, has evolved, so it has evolved not to reflect, in a sense, the experience of the crisis. So it's no longer just focused on efficiencies and the benefits of scale and scope economies and competition and wider choice, which were very much the, the focus before the crisis. We tended to leave stability a little bit on the back burner before the crisis because we had this impression that the markets could manage this risk on its own. Uh, we were proven wrong on that. So when we come back to the single market for capital market, for capital and integration, we have now to expand the rationale, not just on efficiency through scale and scope, et cetera, not just on choice, but also on stability. And it, capital market union benefits stability in two ways. One, it addresses this over-dependence in Europe on bank funding, so it's a diversification tool in itself, a sort of macro diversification tool, makes the economy less subject to shocks coming through one dominant funding source. And also, as we have heard, from several speakers this morning and uh, also from Vitra now. It's also important as a, a means to enhance the quality of risk sharing um, and therefore reduce vulnerability to idiosyncratic shocks. Of course, I agree with Vitor that although CMU is itself a sort of financial stability measure and we think will improve resilience of the EU economy, we have to be careful that in creating it we don't build other sources of risk. But there, I think we have already put a lot of microprudential management in place. Uh, Vitor makes the point that some of these tools are not being used, but the tools are there to be used, and that's uh, important to remember. 
and we are looking at the macroprudential dimension, and we will do so in our, uh, in our consultation on the macroprudential review. But there I will just say very quickly that while I think we need to watch and monitor, we have to be very careful before we take action <coughs> that we understand the implications of any action on that level for the functioning of the system. So that's about what I would say in terms of rationale. In terms of strategy and ambition, well, we've adopted a slightly different strategic approach to CMU to that before the crisis. We maintain a long-term vision of where the European capital market should go, but we have more focus on short-term deliverables. So I want to stress that we're not less ambitious in terms of where we want to end up, but we're more pragmatic, I think, in focusing on what can be achieved and in what time frame. And the idea we have here, and I think it was mentioned by the Commissioner this morning, is that by delivering in the short term, we believe we can build momentum, we can build the <coughs> credibility of the project. And if we can build the credibility of the project, this will enhance the, the prospects of delivering the more difficult, the more fundamental reforms, some of which Victor has mentioned in his speech. This logic is because you know, what we've learned from before the crisis is that the Commission cannot deliver capital market integration on its own. We can have all the plans we like, but if we don't have buy-in from the other stakeholders, from other institutions, from member states, particularly from the private sector, then this just remains a plan. And you mentioned Giovannini. Uh, the, the, the Giovannini report had an ambitious but realistic timeline of three years. I'm 12 years older now, and we still haven't delivered all of those uh, barriers, but uh, I'm sure we will get there eventually before I retire, at least. So I think that's the method. So just to be clear, we are not being less ambitious, but we're being more pragmatic in the way in which we approach uh, the, the strategy itself. Now a few words on where we are. The action plan, you know, was adopted in September of last year. It had 33 measures across six key objectives. Why do we have 33 measures? Why do we have so many objectives? Well, it's because there's no particular silver bullet to create a single market in capital. You have to chip away at all the various deficiencies. It would be nice to have a nice clean narrative, a nice clean sequence, but it doesn't work out like that. You have to work across a broad spectrum of areas, and that's why we have so many measures across so many um, key ob objectives. These objectives, however, have been structured in a way that approaches what we call the funding escalator. So the objectives start by improving financing opportunities for startups, for venture capital, so the entry phase. We will then facilitate generalized access to capital markets. We then want to promote investment in longer term investment in infrastructure. We of course want to foster the demand side, so we want to foster the, the re retail and uh, institutional investment. We want to facilitate recovery in the banking sector. Now this has often been commented that we have this section in the CMU about bank balance sheets and strengthening bank balance sheets. But this recognizes the fact that no matter what we do, however we integrate capital markets, the European economy will rela remain reliant substantially on bank financing. And so we have to take care that we can use the CMU to improve uh, on that side along the lines that, that Ben Wall was saying. And then lastly, of course, we have a quintessential objective, which is to promote cross-border investment. And, and that's one which the Commission has had uh, for uh, a long time. As I said, I prefer to avoid long lists of, uh, of achievements, even when they are achievements. So I'm not going to go through all that we have done or will do in the course of this year, which are our sort of short-term focus. What I will say is that um, we have taken a series of actions under each of these priority objectives. So under venture capital early, or sort of at the startup phase, we have taken we're proposing a legislative proposal to enhance the functioning of passport or venture capital funds. The Commissioner mentioned this morning the idea of a European fund of funds for venture capital. In terms of facilitating generalized access, we have lightened the load in terms of prospectuses. We're developing a work stream on SME access, on SME growth markets. Promoting long-term investments, we have already recalibrated the capital charges for in infrastructure under Solvency II and we're now awaiting advice from IOPA on corp investment corporates to do the same thing. Retail institutional investment, we have a green paper out there on retail financial services. We had pretty good response to that, over 420 responses. We're now monitoring those. I think this is an important green paper 
in terms of understanding how we might promote an equity culture at, at the retail level. We are also, of course, reviewing the scope for the European pension product that will also help on the demand side. In terms of facilitating recovery in the banking sector, the securitization proposal, which of course has been on the table since last year and we are awaiting an opinion from the Parliament in November. We would like to have had it sooner, but it's, we will take it in November. And that will be important, we think, in helping banks to, to, to manage uh, assets on, on their balance sheet. And then in terms of promoting cross-border investment, we are, again, studying barriers to the free movement of capital. We have an expert group set up on that. We have an expert group set up to further improve cross-border functioning of market infrastructure. So this is going back to everywhere in Giovannini, but uh, picking up what is left. And of course, we have a public consultation on the cross-border distribution of, of UCITS. So I think to sum up where we are, and not giving you the long list, I think we've had a good start. I think as the commissioner said this morning, we need to maintain the momentum because if we don't maintain the momentum, this will just run into the ground. And it's important to maintain the momentum because the next steps are those slightly more difficult challenges, the ones that uh, the commissioner refers to as higher hanging fruit, although I have to be honest, the ones we're reaching for are not all that low. Um, so it's, they're relatively low hanging fruit. And these are things like insolvency framework, taxation, and uh, you know, uh, securities holders' rights, as, as Victor mentioned. I think maybe I will stop there and then come back to these other issues in the question and answer. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. We, we'll have plenty of time to discuss um, among you and then with the audience, so don't worry. Uh, you, you can be short and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we can come back to any issue. So, David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> this is an important topic, uh, and I'm very happy to be here to uh, comment on it. Uh, it's easy to get lost in the top-down macro views of risk sharing and, and various other uh, monetary policy transmission and all those things when you think about capital markets. Uh, I would recommend think of it bottom-up. Uh, you have borrowers, you have lenders and intermediaries, and uh, they all have different requirements, and you've got to find a way to match them to meet those requirements. <coughs> um, lenders uh, worry about the maturity worry about uh, currency risk, they worry about other kinds of risks, so about risk evaluation in general. Uh, somebody who is uh, uh, 75 years old uh, has a different saving profile than somebody who is 35 years old and a different ability to bear risk, than, uh, and, and that has to be understood uh, as that feeds through the system. Likewise, you're looking at uh, a borrower. If it's a large corporate, uh, presumably has a foreign exchange risk to worry about, uh, it's got liquidity to worry about and uh, maturity and uh, uh, other kinds of elements to fit his particular or her particular needs. So then third said it's intermediaries right now. Uh, banks are in the middle of this and banks have their own requirement. They have to meet CRB4, they have to meet liquidity requirements, uh, TLAC and all kinds of regulations that have to be met in order to facilitate this, this transaction. But ultimately, Somebody's got to transform the risk uh, from what the lender is prepared to bear to what the borrower is prepared to bear. So that is, is, is the way you think about that. And, and so when you, when you think of a proposal, you sort of ask yourself, do these proposals address any of these things and help with that? Because if it, if it doesn't, then it won't either foster a sound banking system nor will it foster a, a liquid, efficient uh, capital markets. Now, uh, let me start with uh, one very important thing you have to remind yourself of, and that is capital markets are not without intermediaries. The capital markets needs an intermediary. If you're a large corporate and you want to do an IPO or you want to do some debt capital markets operations, you need a bank uh, because you can't distribute. It's only the bank that can distribute. The bank has a, a huge sales force that has access to a uh, thousand uh, uh, lenders who are prepared to buy the paper. So you've got to think about within capital markets, it's not just that all of a sudden you know, you've got these liquid markets out there and, and nobody in between. There is somebody in between. That's a very, very important institution. <coughs> we usually call the bank. Uh, and in capital markets, it tends to be investment banks because they're the ones who originate and distribute, risk manage, repackage, and get it done. But so those institutions have to function well. If they don't function well, capital markets don't work well. There's no way 
that if, that if we're not prepared to take down a big uh, parcel of equity, the, the, the corporate isn't going to be able to do the IPO. He can't do it himself. So it's very, very important to think that you know, if you've got sick banks, you will have sick capital markets. Those two go hand in hand. <coughs> um, now, what does the intermediary have to be able to do to make capital markets work? Well, one thing he has to be able to do is, uh, and it's a talking about own book here, he's got to have good research in the sense that, that uh, if you, you need to have company research that tells you what this company is about, uh, what risk is affiliated, what's associated with that debt that the company's issue, and then you can go out to the ultimate purchases and they, they, if, you, if you do good research, they listen to you and you sell it to them. So again, it comes back to the, 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 credit, a, the credit evaluation function is hugely important in a good, in a good functioning capital markets. Uh, somebody buying uh, 100,000 uh, euros worth of, uh, of Siemens has no idea uh, Siemens earnings, Siemens risk profile, Siemens uh, international exposure, Siemens possible liability to legal charges and whatnot. Doesn't know. We do. So that information has to be found its way into the price and has to be transmitted. Uh, the second thing, and this is this is actually sort of goes back to the to the original function that banks had, is there uh, workout situations, uh, and that particularly in in the SME sector. Um, you need to understand how long do you want to let an institution run before you close it down, before you push it into insolvency. Um, it's a hard thing to do. Again, banks have relationships that can make that work. So it doesn't push away the capital markets, but it aids the capital markets in making that assessment. Uh, make, and there is, clearly it goes hand in hand. Uh, the uh, um, other thing is, um, be, quick, quick, be quick and flexible. Uh, and here, um, you need to know the company, have relationships in order to be able to do that. You can't very quickly, unless you do it in money markets, you can't very quickly issue a very large piece of debt and a very large piece of equity. On the other hand, the size strongly benefits capital markets transactions. So if you want to do a, a, a billion dollar, Google wants to raise a billion dollar debt, even though it, even though it doesn't need it, just wants to test the markets, um, there's no way a single bank can take that. For that, you need, you need liquid, fluid capital markets that can price that, that can hold it, can distribute it, and can make that work. That can manage the FX risk associated with that and uh, all, kinds of, all kinds of other elements. So these are the kind of things you have to think about when you ask yourself, what is the optimal system? Um, the, the, in the background of that is the institutional setting in the sense that if you are a country where you're dominated by, by large corporates, uh, relatively speaking, by large corporates, you're much more likely want to have large, deep capital markets. If you're dominated by small SMEs, you probably tend to have more uh, a drifting towards banking relationships that can evaluate you, that have long-term relationships, even family relationships that know each other and prepare to keep you afloat when times are bad. So it's the structure of the economies, in, in, of the corporate sector, of the industrial sector, that has a strong element on what the banking, what, what the, what, sorry, what the intermediation system looks like. We sometimes tend to think that, gee, you know, we just put the banks in place and it's a bad thing, or gee, the U.S. was so clever, put its capital markets in place. No, it didn't. Uh, these things evolved hand in hand, and it's very, very important to understand that things that sort of evolve together, uh, you can't just kind of impose policy movements from above to put them asunder and to say, I want it this way because the U.S. does it well. That's why we want capital markets. That, that, it won't work, or you will destroy more than you put in place. That's just a, on an aside. Um, the, uh, let me just briefly address the question of uh, if uh, um, I were working in this building, which I'm not, uh, what would I recommend to uh, my management for what should go first? Um, I would say mortgages and securitized products. Why? Because you can standardize them. If we find a way to securitize mortgages, either through an agency approach to where the U.S. does it, then you have, and then you have eligible mortgages, a standardized products. You serve several things, including what uh, John just mentioned. Then you take them off of, of banks' balance sheets, which is a good thing, uh, and, you, and you have a standardized product to put out there. It's much harder to put to, to create a corporate debt market. The U.S. corporate debt market, in fact, is very, very illiquid, and you need to have a big dealership and broker dealers to make and and, and, uh, uh, de and sort of market makers to make that work. Very, very hard to do. Uh, uh, a mortgage back 
securities markets is easy to, it's, well, it's not easy to create, but it's a re relatively easy product to understand. It's well diversified and it kind of gives a model for how to way forward. Next thing I would do is uh, uh, consumer receivables. So car loans and any kind of, anything you can put a lot of people to have, a little bit of, you put it together, make one big thing, slice it up and you sell it. Now, I know all of you sitting here, many people are sitting here saying, well, that's what got us into trouble in 2008. It did. Uh, it doesn't mean we should throw out the baby with the bathwater. We should look at securitization again. And I'm very, very uh, 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 pleased to hear that, that that has enjoyed a fair amount of attention within the commission and elsewhere. I think that's very, very commendable and should be very supportive of that. And it's only, <coughs> excuse me, after all of that, that's when I would go and start worrying about corporate debt because there the requirements are enormous. And, and you know this much better than I do because you got insolvency law, you got different, corp different corporate law, you got different taxation across jurisdictions. So you just, you know, exactly as you said, all you can do is keep at it, keep chipping away at it little by little by little and hope that you're finally going to get there. And I think it's exactly the right approach. But I doubt whether two years from now we're going to have a European-wide corporate debt market where big corporates can issue debt and have a reasonable enough liquidity. I don't think that's going to work, uh, even though I wish it would, but it isn't. Whereas securitization, you might achieve that. Um, the other thing I would look at, and again, it's a hard thing to do, is uh, institutional investors are important uh, for capital markets. They're not, they're not totally necessary to make it work because you can distribute more widely, but they are important as a, as a long-term holder and here pension funds, insurance companies. So solvency two and, and CRD four tend to be somewhat restrictive as far as those things are concerned. And one might want to now that we have a bit more experience, kind of look at it from that point of view. How can we induce our, uh, institutional investors, our, uh, uh, the growth of institutional investors? And of course, defined uh, contributions from going in pension funds from defined contributions to defined benefits is uh, going to be a big step forward. But again, that is a huge, national kind of effort that highly politicized and very difficult very difficult to do uh, so theoretically it's easy to say but I fully recognize the difficulties of getting that of getting that to do um, the benefits from a well functioning capital markets are enormous uh, they give you competition they don't allow banks anymore to be the price setters which is a great thing they give also liquidity for the banking sector itself uh, plus for the corporate in terms of the way treasuries uh, manage their capital structure. It's just a fabulous thing. It gives you good risk pricing, uh, much better than what we have now. In the banking relationship, it's always a question as to who has the power. The bank has the power, it's gonna show up in the risk spreads. The corporate has, to show, has the power, it's gonna be smaller risk spreads. So you, you don't quite get the market determined risk uh, premium that you get if you have much broader capital market. So, uh, you know, so uh, even though, it uh, uh, may not be something that my industry is wholeheartedly excited about, but I'd rather, <laughs> I'd rather, as an economist, I'd rather look forward to deep and broad capital markets as being a strong competitor to the banking system. Never forget, though, that to make that work, you've got to have sound banks sitting in the middle of that to make that work, originate and distribute. I will, at this point, not uh, talk about the macro side of it, but there are obviously mon monetary policy transmission um, uh, advantages that come out of that. Um, and, but uh, that's probably perhaps left to a, different, to a different time. Thank you very much, Benoit. Thank you, David. Th th that was uh, extremely, uh, extremely um, thoughtful, and I guess the, the, uh, the, your last remark on competition is a perfectly appropriate remark as a transition to the next speaker, because competition uh, will be uh, for the benefit of the, of the end user and the investor. So, uh, Guillaume, perhaps the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and thanks to the uh, ECB and the uh, Commission to have invited uh, a representative of financial users, and uh, in particular savers and uh, individual investors. Uh, CMU for us is uh, uh, very critical, uh, at last, I would say, because uh, we are almost 60 years after the Treaty of Rome, uh, which uh, was set up, and I just quote, uh, first articles of Treaty of Rome, huh, to set up a common market in good services and capital. And uh, financial services is an area where, uh, and I, I don't, uh, I a bit uh, maybe blunt compared to, for example, the ECB. Uh, Benoit said uh, it is not yet completed. I said, I would say <laughs> there is no such thing as a 
common market for uh, financial services, especially for uh, retail investments. What is worse is that if you look at the European Commission's annual uh, balance scorecard, uh, consumer scorecard, sorry, uh, of all consumer markets in the EU, pensions and investments are the worst performing every year. To make it even worse, it's not only a perception. When you look at independent research from Better Finance, we publish every year a, um, a research report on the real return of uh, long-term and pension savings in Europe, but also there is other independent research from the Commission, from uh, other consumer organizations. Uh, a real uh, return after fees and after inflation are too often negative uh, over time. And uh, when looking, in fact, at pension savings, uh, they are also uh, most often uh, underperforming capital markets and by a, by a wide margin uh, often. So we welcome very much the, the capital market union. In fact, uh, savers and individual investors are at the heart of the capital market union. I'm not saying this. It's Commissioner Hill. I'm saying that, uh, and he's right, because 60% uh, of financial assets are owned indirectly or directly by uh, households. Uh, I'd like also very quickly to dispel two uh, uh, things we say about savers and individual investors, uh, that they are uh, risk averse and they are short termist. They are less short-termist than uh, institutional investors because more than 60% of their financial assets are in long-term vehicles. And this goes up to 90% if you in were including property as well. So they are long-term investors, actually. They are less risk-averse than institutional investors, and there's plenty of evidence for this. If you look, for example, at the assets of uh, Western Europe insurers in 2010, 8% in own risk equity. Of course, I take away unit-linked uh, insurance, which is on the, shoulder, on the shoulders of the uh, clients. That's way before solvency too, by the way. Uh, so, uh, and when you look at the portfolio of, uh, of households, uh, there is still a few percent directly in shares, but through investment funds, through pension funds, and sometimes unit-linked insurers, there are much more than that. When you look more specifically, for example, at the small cap capital market, and uh, I have an expert beside me, uh, the uh, size of presence of individual investors in the small cap market, primary or secondary, is twice what it is for the big caps. So if it's twice there, it means someone else is less intervening there. Guess who? Uh, so it's very good to say that we are at the heart of the CMU. But in the CMU action plan, there are only two pages on individual investors, and we think there is one key building block missing. And that was one of the general questions I was asked by the uh, ECB and the Commission, is uh, uh, how, and in fact, it's a question yeah, of, the, of the panel, uh, how to encourage savers to turn to capital markets to complement their pensions from first pillar. Uh, it's a very good question. It's very hard to find an answer in the action plan, at least for me. Uh, uh, I don't know if you know about Professor John Kay, who is writing in the Financial Times, who has been commissioned by the UK government two years ago for a review of the UK equity markets. He published a great book recently called Other People's Money. The title itself is worth something. And what he says is that we need a simpler world where uh, in which uh, ch ch short chains of intermediaries uh, uh, provide a more direct link between savers and the assets in which their funds are deployed. And that's really uh, a key thing I'd like to, to, to stress. Uh, and I would very shortly uh, illustrate why when you look at the current landscape of retail investment products. Uh, first, and it's part of what John Gay is addressing, we need and it's a, a, a priority, we need more transparency on performance uh, uh, returns and fees. And actually, it is not one of the 33 measures mentioned by John, but it is in the action plan. <laughs> it is in the, in the narrative. Unfortunately, it's not in the final list, but I, I hope that does not mean it's going to be forgotten. Um, so uh, what is very worrying is that at the same time, there is a huge step in the wrong direction as the EU authorities are currently uh, eliminating uh, the disclosure 
to standardize and supervise disclosure of performance of retail investment products in the PRIPS regulation. We will not even know uh, if the product has made money or not with the future um, uh, PRIPS document. So we, we want some uh, more consistency uh, in the approach to make really this uh, a top priority. Another transversal priority, which is uh, also uh, in the action plan, is to end the double taxation of investment income, if you really want to have integration within your Europe, but also more generally discrimination against EU savers that are sourcing their investment products in another member state, and we answered in detail on the green paper on financial, uh, retail financial services on this topic. I was asked to tell you a little more precisely about the products uh, investment funds, personal pension products, and uh, shares and bonds. Investment funds, they are essential, and even more so, I mean, you all know that uh, with uh, the uh, longevity increasing, with the pillar one government pensions going south, as the Americans would say, it will be even more essential. It will be also even more essential because we badly need uh, positive net real returns over the long term, especially in today's era of severe financial repression. <coughs> uh, uh, as you know now, uh, short-term savers in banks are uh, almost all losing money, and as I said, uh, there are also problems uh, in the longer term and pension area. Just bear in mind, and, and I really hope the ECB as well realized this, that uh, even if you contribute for 40 years, uh, roughly to give you a very ballpark idea, your savings, your contributions, will give you more or less five years of retirement income. All the rest has to come from returns. So returns matter. Um, so investment funds, uh, in, in view of the CMU, the, the, the key problem is that when you look at financial savings of households, and that relates to what uh, John K. Enners uh, pointed out, there are only 7% of the financial assets of um, households. Why so? It's because they don't invest directly in investments. They are sold products which are more packaged, which are wrapping these investment funds unit-linked insurance products, personal pension products that add uh, uh, typically a layer of fees and, of course, again, estrange more the saver from uh, the real assets uh, where its funds are, are deployed. Uh, I give you a striking one example, huh? the French corporate savings plan. Only invested in AIFs, usage funds, are forbidden, forbidden. It is the only pan-European retail investment product, but it's not sold to retail people in many countries, in France, in Germany, in some other countries. So it's only AI funds, and the uh, default option is, guess what, money market funds, which is not really a long-term product and which is uh, losing money, has been losing money for years. So there, there's a lot to do in that area. Also, one key thing where we have a problem with the current approach and the speeches is uh, choice. We have too much choice, not too little. There are 35,000 investment funds alone, and as I just told you, it's only 7% of the product range offered to uh, individual households. What we need is the reverse. We need much simpler offering, but a cost-effective and uh, performing one. And we hope that in the future measures of the uh, CMU Action Plan, we, we, we can have that. Very briefly, so on, on personal pensions and, and securities, uh, personal pensions, one key measure of the Action Plan, and we are, uh, well, implicitly in the Action Plan, is we really badly need a pan-European personal pension, the PEP, or PPP, as you like. Uh, what uh, we are concerned about, because and we need uh, correction, a simple and cost-effective one. Uh, but we are concerned because the, uh, uh, when the Commission asked for advice on such a PEP, that was in July 2012, and we are almost four years later, and we still have currently now an AOPA consultation on, not on PEP, on PPPs. Would it not be better or, you know, look at complementing by uh, trying to harmonize uh, the regulations of the myriads and fragmented PPPs. I think that's a recipe for not doing anything like in the past 60 years uh, because the probability of achieving this in the short term uh, is uh, close to zero. 
so, so we really need uh, uh, this PEP, and we, we hope, uh, we heard from Commissioner Hill that there will be another consultation from the Commission, uh, but uh, I heard John Berrigan talking about short-term deliverables. This is certainly one. One last word on uh, securities. As I said, we, we, we ask, you know, how to encourage households to go to capital markets. Not only they are not encouraged, but they are discouraged, and, and sometimes it's even banned. I just give the example of the otherwise very, very well thought of proposal of PEP from AOPA. It will be banned to invest directly in securities in the PEP. Uh, I've been working in the US. I have uh, one IRA, individual retirement account, simple, popular, low cost. I can do it. Uh, you know, I thought uh, the uh, motto of why doing it simple when you can make it complex was only a French motto, but it seems to be a pan-European <laughs> motto this time. Uh, no, we, we need to, uh, I, I was hearing John talking about promoting equity culture. Th this is frankly missing in the, in the action plan. We need to, um, to uh, give back access of households, at least the ones who want to, the ones who are literate enough, of course, to capital markets, because the policy has been to tailor make capital markets for professional players only. And it's only now in regulated markets that we find some transparency in terms of, uh, of uh, trade uh, information, etc. Uh, we need not to, to ban uh, access to these securities in the key products for, for uh, savers. And one last thing, if you want really an internal market of capital markets, you have to facilitate cross-border voting. It is currently an antiquated, long and complex chain. It doesn't work. And uh, it's very difficult for the uh, beneficial owner of shares uh, to vote. You have also these things called nominee accounts, et cetera, et cetera. I think I've spoke too much, so uh, I will stop there. Thank you, uh, thank you, Guillaume. That's a lot on uh, Sean's plate, so I, I might give him the opportunity to, to answer to some of the uh, points. But uh, how can now the, the floor is yours. No, thanks a lot. Um, it's an honor to be here, and thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts uh, with you. Uh, the European political agenda has shifted from regulation in the aftermath of the financial crisis to fostering growth, and thus hopefully closing now the chapter of slow growth and high unemployment in many parts of Europe. The proposed action plan cl comes at the right time, and uh, the measures contained are pragmatic and from our perspective well chosen. Of course, as we heard already, there are some parts uh, that need to be adjusted or uh, things to be added, but from our perspective, the measures are uh, and actions are well chosen. Deutsche Börse Group fully supports the Capital Market Union Initiative and the proposed action plan. And we are also convinced that a merger between Deutsche Börse Group and the London Stock Exchange would support and accelerate the development of the Capital Markets Union, building a very strong European market infrastructure provider that supports a Capital Markets Union. I will focus in my uh, short speech on two areas of the action plan. Number one, uh, supporting SMEs seeking financing, and the second part, fostering retail investments. I want then, uh, to, would like to then uh, focus on one area, and that's the role of technology, a point that was not touched in any of the uh, speeches today or uh, before, but I believe technology is the catalyst uh, for the change and the improvements we want to achieve. So let me start with the um, SME financing, uh, a part of the action plan, SME with pre-IPO markets and innovative forms of, of financing. Bank funds have been decreasing in the response of higher capital and liquidity requirements. To close the gap in needed funding, alternative non-bank funding channels need to be further developed. We don't see this um, as a competition, but we look at this as a terms of increasing complementary offerings. The European SME landscape is very diverse. SMEs have different company size, different business models. They have different financing needs. 
And in order to address these, no single solution will do. Instead, a whole array of solutions must be applied, and I think this was already addressed uh, in previous speeches. We need to look at all the different ways of equity and debt financing, whether it is venture capital, securitization bonds, crowdfunding, or any other way of raising capital. The whole spectrum of alternative financing instruments must be taken into consideration and must be improved in order to provide products and services to respond to the SME financing needs. Easier access to equity financing, for instance, through venture capital or IPOs could be one way to help uh, innovative businesses to grow. Financial markets, uh, infrastructure providers like Deutsche Börse Group or London Stock Exchange Group or the hopefully potentially merged uh, group could play a key role in increasing efficiency and transparency at the pre-IPO stage by bringing issuers and investors together. Particularly in Europe, the process is complicated by a wide variance in market practices and regulatory structures that govern the financial markets in the different member states. We as Deutsche Börse Group have staked the first claim in the pre-IPO uh, equity section by launching Deutsche Börse Venture Network in 2015. We are aiming at creating an entire ecosystem for growth by giving growth companies access to a strong network of uh, attractive partners. But we won't stop there. We are looking into further instruments for the SME market. Another important area of the action plan uh, is fostering the uh, retail investments. This was touched before. Um, we do not have, and that's uh, clearly outlined in the action plan, we do not have strong capital market culture in Europe, and equity financing does not, does not have the same significance in each uh, European country. There's in fact a substantial difference. 40% uh, of Swedes use equities for long-term capital formation. Only 14% of the German uh, people do the same. So there's a wide uh, difference between uh, the use of equity for uh, savings and financing. To change a financing and savings culture towards equity depends on several factors. There are many factors that will influence this. I would like to mention three that I believe are important. Number one, we need uh, to improve the education and information to regain trust uh, in uh, financial players and develop a culture change towards equity savings and equity financing. Then well-balanced, and balanced is the important word, investor protections rule uh, are also important. Assessing the uh, suitability of an investment should not be too complex and resource intensive. And third, a harmonization across Europe would be beneficial for all and facilitate the means of financing via the capital markets. So now let me address uh, the third point, and that's the role of technology. Technology is a game changer for the entire financial industry anywhere in the world, and technological progress is beneficial because it generates new business opportunities and increases efficiency, stability, and innovation. The securities and the derivatives market have experienced the innovative force of technology already more than 20 years ago when the complete uh, um, uh, uh, industry changed. However, now more and more other segments of the global finance get first-hand experience of how technology is able to completely change the existing business models. Emerging companies will set in motion a far-reaching transformation of the financial industry. And important, IT is not a back-office activity. Quite to the contrary, IT stands at the forefront of the financial industry and the innovation in this uh, industry. In fact, technology, uh, technological progress and IT are increasingly playing a key role for the performance of the entire economy. 
Buzzwords like digitization, industry 4.0, or blockchain have made the disruptive change popular to a wider public, but buzzwords are one. Making innovation come true is the other side. It is as simple as this. Only by remaining innovative, we will be able to achieve growth in the future. Therefore, and this is uh, my request and my hope, to make use of this technological opportunity, there should be special focus on supporting technology innovation in Europe, supporting the growing fintech uh, sector, and supporting a close collaboration between these fintech companies and the regulators. The overall aim should be to establish a more attractive environment for these companies and thus create jobs and growth across Europe. So yes, there is further integration of uh, European capital markets and the supporting innovative uh, initiatives of the action plan are the right way forward. But we should not forget at the end of the day, it's all about new products and new services, and they need to be implemented using technology. One last comment, um, not about technology, just uh, closing with one uh, request. Europe is competing on a global scale. It is important to strengthen Europe and make it a very attractive and strong financial place and to do this, we need a strong European financial infrastructure provider. So therefore, my request and my uh, point again, we believe uh, that a potential merger between London Stock Exchange Group and Deutsche Börse would support the um, uh, activities we are uh, undertaking and would support the development of the Capital Markets Union. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hauker. I mean, Sean and I will make no comment about your last uh, statement. Uh, I, uh, but, but I would like to thank you very much for uh, linking, for tie tying our discussion with the, uh, with the FinTech discussion. Uh, it's true that this has not been raised uh, so far uh, today. Mm -hmm. And it sometimes seems that it's, uh, these are two, dis two parallel discussions run by, led by different people in a somewhat disconnected way. Mm -hmm. But uh, we are talking of an horizon which is an horizon where a lot of what we're seeing today in the digital uh, industry and in the, in the fintech uh, ecosystem will have uh, consequences for the, for the mainstream financial industry. It, pr it probably does not have these consequences today, but at the horizon we're discussing, it will have consequences. Uh, and so we have to project ourselves at that kind of horizon where uh, fintech uh, will, will matter a lot. So it's, uh, it's very important that we can link uh, the two discussions. Uh, Rick, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Um, I'd like to touch upon three topics today. One is corporate insolvency reform, and I know there's been a number of discussions talking about the issue, but um, our uh, members have been speaking to an investor community for years about this issue, about how fragmentation of corporate insolvency laws in Europe is discouraging investment. And a couple of months ago, we distributed to all member state governments, both justice ministries as well as treasury departments, publication that's available on our website in case you're interested that tries to pull together all the legal issues, all the economic issues, so the member state governments, the commission and others can all, all, all look at the details. Um, there are three basic reasons um, why, uh, sorry, four reasons why insolvency form really matters. That's okay. Um, first of all, it assesses a bankruptcy process, it doesn't have to be exactly like the one in the States, enables uh, the viability of entities to be decided about whether they're a viable ongoing concern or not. If you have a process where you automatically dive into a liquidation scenario, if, if somebody becomes insolvent, it takes that question off the table and potentially takes a lot of jobs off the market. Um, it enables the restructuring to, uh, to proceed pretty quickly in an orderly way provides legal certainty to all different parties, and ena enables the settlements of claims to be done in a much more efficient manner. Um, there has been some work done already, um, and which is certainly welcome, on the uh, regulation on insolvency pr proceedings, which goes into effect next year. 
Uh, it imposes rules governing the jurisdiction in which insolvency proceedings can be opened. It also sets rules of recognition um, um, and other mutual recognition for other member states. In short, it's certainly a step in the right direction, but we don't feel that it really addresses the, the key issues. We have five key issues that are described in this publication which really do, we do feel would make a big difference and I think are worthy of quite a bit more debate and hopefully the Commission will take a look at this as it looks at uh, insolvency reform in the future years. One is the development of a concept of a stay. Uh, in other words, if somebody becomes bankrupt, an automatic stay, so there's clear, flexible rules and process to stay creditors while a firm's restructuring some process. Uh, another one is debtor and possession financing. Effectively, it's a super priority creditor status for new financing. Basically, enables the existing entity to keep going while the existing creditors restructure. Cram down is a big issue. Um, there's lots of insolvency proceedings can basically get held up by very minority creditors who don't have a strong economic interest in, in the reorganization. There needs to be a process to basically weigh those benefits in a fair but um, economically viable way. On creditors' rights issues, it needs to be processed for ensuring creditors have the right to propose a restructuring plan. The last thing is in reporting, to in introduce performance reporting by national insolvency regulators on the costs, time scales, and the recovery schemes. Um, what we then next did, in terms of the, that's on the legal side of things, uh, those are important issues. In many European countries, that would be a significant change to the existing regimes. But we do think it's at least worth talking about the pros and cons about what those mechanisms could potentially do to reduce the fragmentation across Europe and encourage investment. What we then tried to do is quantify, particularly for the Justice Departments, whether all this work, and this is going to be quite a bit of work, is worth it. And in conclusion, uh, some economics we conditioned uh, analysis from Frontier Economics concluded that it, it is worth fighting for. And we thought we put this together as a means for discussion. But basically what we asked them to do is to try to quantify if you had an increase in recovery rates through improved bankruptcy proceedings across Europe of, let's say, 10 percent, how much would that cause a drop in bond yields? And according to this study, uh, approximately an 18 to 37 basis point reduction in bond spreads could be expected if you improved recovery rates to an, a European-wide average of 87 percent of par. Um, if you add up all the numbers, and a little chart here that you probably can't see, but it's included in the publication, it describes on a GDP-weighted basis where the savings would be if insolvency reform was put together along the lines roughly of what we talked about before, but most importantly, just simply to increase the recovery rate up to, say, an average of 85 percent. And there's significant savings that we estimate between roughly 40 to 80 billion per year, which is roughly a quarter to a half a percent of European GDP. I mean, everybody can argue the assumptions. We encourage, actually, that there to be a debate on this. But it's something worth taking a look at because the economic savings could be very significant, particularly in Southern Europe and Eastern Europe. Um, briefly, on securitization, this has been an important topic mentioned today on many different panels. Uh, the industry certainly has uh, taken on board uh, the need for significant change during the financial crisis. Initially in Europe, the problems in securitization were caused by American securitizations being sold to European investors. And one of the huge differences is the regulatory framework for the origination of assets in the States is very different than it has been here. Um, if you look at the performance of European securitizations, it's been very, very solid and continues to be solid both before the crisis and after the crisis. And, um, we welcome the initiatives to create a, the STS framework, as well as uh, changes, concurrent changes in the, in the capital requirements regulation to give uh, securitization which achieved the STS label favorable capital charges within the CR, D, CRR framework. Um, so if you look at the numbers, uh, they're, there's, they're very compelling in terms of how much uh, funding could be raised. Uh, in the last couple of years, there's been about 80 billion or so euros of securitizations placed, and that's all high-quality securitizations, and we would probably think would, the majority would meet the definition of STS securitization. Um, I think, as Commissioner Hill mentioned, if we put this regulation in place, there's easily scope for another 100 billion uh, of funding. Before the crisis, there was, in Europe, the high-quality portion was actually even larger than that, but even if we can get back an additional 100 billion of funding, that's a meaningful number that would be worth fighting for. 
Um, we also want to note that there's a strong consensus among the different players in the market on the STS proposal itself between the issuers, the investors, uh, banks, rating agencies, and different participants. And recently, our association, together with the FAMA, ICMA, Insurance Europe, uh, put together a joint letter to really demonstrate unity within the industry about all the different proposals and, and how the whole, piece, the whole thing puts together. And broadly, we do agree that the 55 criteria that you need to meet for the, the, uh, for the designation of the STS broadly are workable and doable. However, in the words of one of our auto manufacturer members, says you have to basically look at the securitization market as a machine. And so, for example, if you buy a car, and if you ask, if you pay 80%, put 80% of the parts in the car, will you get 80% of the speed of the car on the 90% of what you put in? And of course not. The car needs all the parts in it to make the machine work at all. It's not a matter of if you go part way on securitization reform, you'll get part of the market back. It's important to look at the whole market as a whole between what the issuers are looking for, what the investors are looking for, and what the, um, uh, what the different participants in the middle need to basically provide in terms of information to, be, to, to, to give the information to uh, the parties that they need. Um, the other thing in terms of principles we would suggest on securitization is it's important not to take all the risk out of the market. Um, this product is intended to basically help in the facilitation of risk transfer so that banks as a predominant um, originator in Europe, we can also certainly work for non-banks. It, it's, it's product, it's institution agnostic in terms of originators. Um, there needs to be a, an acknowledgement that some of the tranches will be ultra safe. Some of the tranches will have risk, which enables risk transfer to occur, which then will free up more capital in the banks to enable more lending to SMEs and other participants. That's an important thing to keep in mind. Cover bonds and securitizations are different. They have many similarities. Um, but they should, be, they should be recognized in terms of different complementary, and we need both types of markets. On the last section, I want to just build on a couple points that Hauke made on the SME side of things. Um, our, our association has been actively working with a number of market participants to try to actually get more information to SMEs across Europe to help job creation and uh, to basically make them aware of where they can get money. It doesn't matter whether the money is from a bank in the form of a bank loan from a non-bank, from a participant, for example, in the crowdfunding market or business <coughs> angels, or from a, a venture capital provider or somebody else. And last year and early this year, we distributed this um, document called Raising Finance for Europeans SMEs in six languages across Europe to about a million of our members, SME clients across Europe, uh, to raise awareness of, of how the institutions that provide money think how they provide loan criteria, whether they're banks or non-banks, where they get their money from, why they do accept loan up, certain types of loan applications and sometimes would rather, rather reject them. But one of the key conclusions we found, which is actually demonstrated in this chart, uh, which some statistics backed up by Boston Consulting Group, is we did find that uh, for lots of both banks and non-banks, many institutions across Europe are actually looking for more loan applications. There's two big exceptions, however. Startups have a difficult time uh, raising funds, and also high growth companies with negative projected cash flows also have a hard time raising money. In many cases, those types of SMEs need equity. They don't really, or aren't, um, a loan from a bank or even a non-bank probably isn't the right product. So I just want to highlight a couple figures from this chart, um, and we'll come back to detail on it. One of them actually supports the discussion earlier on pensions reform. Uh, we've noticed, and this is, all gets into the discussion on where the money is going to come from in terms of risk capital for European growth. In the States, there's 15 trillion euros of private pension money. Here in Europe, there's 4.3 um, million euros of private pension money, of which 85% is sitting in the Netherlands and the UK and a couple other countries. It's very concentrated. So there needs to be a much greater emphasis on gathering risk capital, which very much fits into the Commission's comments throughout the day, Sean's earlier comments on the need for retail financial services, raising of awareness. Guillaume raised the point of retail distribution as well. That's a hugely important issue that um, our members are very focused on. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much, uh, Rick. Um, I would like to thank all speakers who've been 
remarkably uh, disciplined uh, in terms of uh, in terms of our uh, time allocation, which gives you plenty of time to discuss, uh, which is good. Um, let me. Uh, I, I would just like. Don't want to take too much time, but I would just like to make two remarks on uh, on the um, on that first uh, phase of the discussion. The first remark is about the is about the tone of the discussion. The tone was very much practical, uh, more micro focused than macro focused. Uh, very much focused on um, the uh, all the uh, practical things we have to fix to uh, to make um, savers and investors uh, meet. Um, and um, and sometimes sobering in terms of what we can achieve or what we can achieve in the short term, which I think fits with the uh, initial presentation by Sean of what the uh, ambition of this project. This is not about having a grand vision. There is a vision, but uh, there is also a, a sequence of, uh, of short term uh, to medium term uh, achievements. Uh, and um, that probably reflects also the, the spirit of the times, that we are not at a time where there, there can be a quantum leap in the way uh, cap European capital markets work. Banking union was a quantum leap. It was discussed this morning. We're not at a time where the uh, collectivity, generally stakeholders in Europe, wants to, uh, to make new quantum leaps. And so we have to take it as it is and, uh, and make the best out of it. And that's what you've uh, discussed. Um, also, um, the um, substance of the discussion, I think, was extremely useful also for us from an ECB standpoint. We tend to have a very macro-based uh, uh, vision. We tend to focus very much on the risk-sharing properties of, uh, of capital market union, which matters for us, of course, as a monetary authority, as central bank. Uh, you focus very much on the micro dimension, uh, which is about just meeting saving and investments meet. Uh, and uh, why do we want savings and investment to meet? Because we want to uh, finance good projects. And why do we want to finance good projects? Because we want to create growth. Well, that's also about how to revive long-term growth in Europe. Uh, and uh, so that the discussion captures very well, I think, the two key dimensions of the discussion on CMU, which is the macro dimension, which is very much focused on stabilization, as economists would say, while the micro dimension is very much focused on allocation to use uh, economic terms, that is how to create jobs and growth and long-term growth, and we need both. So it's very important that we, that we uh, at any point in, the, in that discussion, we can reconcile and, and combine the two dimensions of it. Uh, that's about making uh, the monetary union safer and more resilient, but that's also about uh, creating more long-term growth, and that's only by creating long-term growth and uh, bringing money to the projects that have a higher uh, 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 productivity uh, that also will make returns improve uh, in that monetary union. So it also, of course, uh, uh, um, resonates uh, with some of the concerns we have here uh, related to uh, rates being low for, for, a very long, for a very long time. The only way to uh, recreate a higher return in the economy is to improve the functioning of the economy and to make money uh, go uh, where, it, uh, where it ought to go. So I stop my I stop my philosophical remarks here. Uh, let me give a chance to all speakers to react to what each other uh, have said before opening the uh, opening it to the floor. And maybe Sean, you want to react to some of the remarks or, or uh, uh, polite uh, criticisms which were uh, directed at you. All very constructive, I'm sure. Um, on, on the macro, micro. I mean, as somebody who in my new job gets the pleasure of doing both macro and micro. I think what you say is perfectly correct, but I, I mean, I find that, as I said, on the micro level, it's difficult to develop a clear narrative. You have 33 measures, you probably have more, which are not even put in as measures. The narrative is not easy, but the macro does allow you to rationalize why we're doing all these things, and it allows you to tell a story which is not so easy to tell, to tell when you look across 33 measures in, in, in a kind of sequence action plan. So I think this macro micro is also important as a sort of communication to, to, um, to the outside world. I was, uh, one point David made about sick banks equals sick, sick capital markets. I think it's strikingly, uh, striking remark. I think that's why we have objective five in there. It doesn't look initially as, as it's in place. It's about banks inside a capital market plan. But this is not about displacing banks using capital markets. This is about creating a diversified system. And as you said, it should be symbiotic. So the capital markets should be to have a kind of beneficial relationship for banks and, and vice versa. Um, Guillaume made a number of very important points uh, about retail investors. I have to agree this is not the most integrated sector of the market, but that's not because it's been neglected by the Commission. 
Unfortunately, I'm old enough to have sat through five commissioners who have dealt in this field, and every one of them has had in his mandate action on retail markets. And everyone has found how difficult it is. And it's difficult partly because we used to have what were called natural barriers, language proximity. And also because we have this tension between investor benefit from integration and the need for investor protection. And this is a tension which has always been there. Sometimes it's used legitimately, I have to be <coughs> honest, sometimes it's not used so legitimately. I believe, and this is something Hoka has mentioned about technology, I think, and then the Commissioner mentioned it this morning, we believe that technology may allow us to overcome some of these barriers which prevented progress in this field in the past. And it's one of the reasons why I think he's more enthusiastic than he might be, having seen five pre or four previous Commissioners try this and, and not have the sort of success that they wanted to have. On transparency of fees, of course, this, this will be in the new PRIPS document. We, we, what we're trying to do with the PRIPS document is describe the sort of features of a product so that you know when you buy it what you're buying. So it, it tells you what the product is based on, it tells you what the fees are, it tells you whether you can withdraw your money, how quickly you can withdraw your money, what cost. But we're not trying to tell people whether they should choose this product over this product based on returns. That's an investor decision it's not for us to do. But, of course, investors deserve to know what is the basic features of the product itself. On too much choice, I must say I find it idealistically difficult for me to say I would regulate against providing choice. I think it's for the industry to decide how much choice it wants to offer. If you don't like it, you don't, you don't take it. Um, Pan-European pensions, as mentioned by you, Guillaume, also by David and Rick, we are, of course, very keen on this. We are also aware from our past work in this area where the barriers lie. They lie primarily in taxation. There are also legal barriers. We are working ourselves through a consultation to try to identify those barriers, but also to try to identify why these products, why pension products work well in some jurisdictions and don't work well in others, and to see whether or not we can transport some of the the factors which help to generate pension systems at national level to the European level. So basically work with the member states and learn from, from best practice. Uh, Cross-border voting rights. Here we go back to Giovannini. I worked quite a bit on this 10 years, 12 years ago, a nightmare. It's all based on corporate law and goes down even deeper into the whole concept of securities ownership. Can you transfer your rights to vote or not? Or do you have to fly in and vote yourself? And uh, if you have to fly in and vote yourself, you're not going to buy. So I think there's a lot of work to be done there, but it's uh, let me, nobody want down the illusion that it's, uh, it's, it's easy. On insolvency reform, another tricky area, and I said I would come back to it. We know this is a big problem. Um, we know because it creates a lot of legal uncertainty for cross-border investment, and the work that Rick and the F AFME have done, we have read, of course, and we have taken it fully into account. We agree that there needs to be a clear and effective approaches to debt restructuring. This is good for the, the debtor. It's also good for the creditor because he can speed your recovery values. So I think the economics are promising, but I have to say the history of more intrusive approaches around insolvency is a lot less promising. So I think here again, we're going to have to be pragmatic. We're going to have to, I think, use principle-based approaches. So identify what's working in member states. See if we can identify a set of principles which make insolvency frameworks efficient. And then leave it to the member states, perhaps, to reverse engineer that into their own legal systems, rather than the Commission trying to create a single legal framework, as we have done in the past. Let's see. We, we have a consultation open on this since mid-March, I'm told. We'll close on the 14th of June, so I'll do a bit of advertising myself. Please reply to that um, before the middle of June. And there we are said we're, uh, we're proposing a pragmatic approach uh, with the member states. And if we are to plan, we will put forward this principle of the legislative proposal by the end of the year. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. On insolvency framework, let me just also add that this was discussed by Eurogroup ministers uh, in, at their meeting in Amsterdam last uh, Friday. Um, and the reason why it is discussed in the Eurogroup, which is EU19, uh, is that it matters for capital, capital allocation or reallocation across uh, uh, Eurozone countries. And it matters enormously for NPL, non-performing loan resolution, which is one of the uh, 
uh, most uh, uh, important macro issues that we have to face uh, today in the Eurozone. So it again makes the point that you can easily uh, move from the micro to the macro and then back to the macro. Uh, it also matters very much for the functioning of the monetary union. Uh, David, you, you want to add something? Thank you very much. <coughs> Having just uh, publicly disagreed with the ECB's monetary policy, I find it very heartening that I agree with everything I've heard here so far, including from uh, John and from Benoit. I think that... Uh, um, you, you, can, you can keep it, you can stop it here. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I actually mean, I usually mean what I say, and I, this time as well. Uh, I think this is one area where uh, the, the, the conceptual part of it is right. Uh, I think banking union had to come first, then capital markets union. I think that was just the right sequence. I think the emphasis, and, and, and I can just completely echo what John has been saying, namely that this is just hard work. This is just every day you go to work and you change one more rule, one more law, and uh, that's the only way forward here. This, this is not anymore about strategizing and about grand visions and about this and that. We all know what it is. The emphasis on insolvency is very heartening. I think that's exactly right. You cannot have proper corporate markets if you have you know, 18 different insolvency laws. It doesn't work. Uh, as simple as that. I also like the, 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 uh, the analogy to a car. This is something that has to work all together. You can't just leave out one part and then just hope it runs. It doesn't work that way. I think... Uh, Further on the positive side, I think we probably all underestimate the benefit that comes from a really well-functioning European-wide capital markets. And I don't worry so much about how big it is compared to the banking markets. I just worry about that what we have functions really well. It'll grow by itself. There's a natural proclivity for corporates to shift to capital markets away from banking markets, and banks support that because, as I said earlier, they distribute and originate. And uh, so I think we're very much on the right track. I think this is one of this. In many ways, I would think of this as one of the success stories, at least at the concept conceptual level, of uh, European policy. And it's very heartening. So I'm very pleased to be here and to be able to say that after what I said yesterday. <coughs> Guillaume? Um, I, I will not make further comments to what John said about uh, choice, because uh, sometimes uh, the authorities, EU or, or member states, are, are reducing choice and are banning products, as I mentioned several examples. Uh, I would like just to put maybe uh, to make a, a politically incorrect question to my fellow panelists from, from the banks, because I did not mention securitization, and, and I have nothing um, against securitization per se, especially when it's standardized and as proposed by the European Union. But uh, I, I quoted uh, uh, Professor Kay uh, the other time, and uh, according to him, uh, only 3% of UK bank assets is lending to the real economy. So if you are going to securitize part of this 3%, uh, which in layman's term meaning means you know, dumping the book of loans to third party investors, what are you going to do with the proceeds? Because I, I'm, I would like you know, sometimes that we come back to the boring bank that is collecting deposits and lending to the real economy. I, I recognize it's a bit uh, incorrectly stated, but it's just to uh, stir up the debate. Thank you. I'm happy to answer that. And, uh, I came in from the point of view, if the commissioner of the ECB had asked me as to what would be the most likely product to succeed, I would have said to myself, well, I need lots of constituents parts in that, not just five firms, and I need to have large volume and then I cut that up and distribute it across lots of people so I don't have to do it individually. And for that, what comes to mind is mortgages. Mortgage securitization is kind of the, the cornerstone of the securitized markets. And, secure, and once you get one market going, then the next one will follow. It, it's, sort of, it, it's sort of demonstrating success in one area, then you follow in the corporate market and, and other markets and things like that. So that's why, from my point of view, as, as a practical person, I would say, focus on the securitization of mortgages. And that's why we've also elsewhere said that the here, um, public assistance through uh, some kind of agency approach of taking that risk on and to distribute it, I think, uh, would be certainly very supportable from a public policy point of view. <coughs> okay. I just want to, to highlight uh, um, one point and not repeat uh, um, the, the other comments. It's, it's again about harmonization across the different uh, member states. Uh, we have in the different um, countries uh, different regulatory structures, um, different market practices, 
And I think uh, the discussion showed it today. Um, we are uh, in the uh, Capital Markets Union discussion now about uh, the details and executing the details. And um, uh, important is to make sure that we harmonize uh, across Europe. Uh, I think what um, will help us, or what, what is important uh, about this is um, Europe is competing on a global scale and only a very strong Europe can really play uh, the part in the world in the future in a global competition. And therefore, I think we all need to rally behind the, the point of harmonizing across Europe um, and, and building strong structures uh, in Europe. Thank you, uh, Holger. Rick? Uh, I'd like to just touch upon the securitization issue because um, I think Guillaume raises a really important point of how different policymakers look at, for example, U U.S. securitization in the U.S. as compared to European securitization in the U.S. and then each other. In the absence of a Fannie and Freddie and Ginny, which basically absorbs between six to seven trillion dollars of, of mortgage assets off the balance sheets of the bank, in the absence of any kind of European institution like that, and we're not in any way suggesting there should be, but if you assume there isn't going to be a Fannie, Freddie, and Ginny, all those assets, which basically are off the balance sheets of the U.S. banks, which frees up effectively the balance sheets of the American banks to focus on more high-yielding, credit-intensive, higher-margin assets, it changes the business model. It does. So in the absence of an, of an institution, whether at the national pan-European level in Europe, to divert that sector with very high quality assets general, generally, um, it's, it's a more difficult thing, which is actually one of the reasons why this STS proposal is so important. It's actually, we have a tougher job here in Europe because we don't have a Fannie Freddie. Thank you very much. So now it's now time to open to the floor. I'll take two, three questions and bundle them. I will not slide them and tranche them uh, and, and come back to the panel. So yes, please. Yeah, thank you very much for an interesting uh, panel. Uh, it's a pity that Mr. Constancio just left because, um, well, the agency-based idea of residential mortgages might actually be a way even to implement macroprudential policies if you are of the opinion that there's too much or you could just tell your big, or you could just put a lid on the market maybe. Mm -hmm. So why did Europe not choose to go the way of Fannie Mae or of Freddie Mac, if Europeans are so in love with the American capital markets. <laughs> to me, it, it, it appears as if we're learning the wrong lessons, that we need more state and not less state, and that we need, well, yeah, would like to have that discussed. Thank you. Thank you, and I forgot to ask you to introduce yourself. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, please, here. As our Schlieber European Commission, so since uh, Philip established the rule in the morning that the co-authors of the reports can also take the floor, I, I follow up on this. Um, on the insolvency, I would like to, to um, make a, a two comments that also relate to our, uh, to our report, our publication. Um, as Rick had the slide on the EU uh, legislative proposal and on new measures, uh, these were indeed exactly the areas that we looked into, uh, also in the impact assessment uh, that led to the recommendation on a new approach to business failure uh, already a couple of years ago. Exactly those areas, uh, they, they show how complex it is. Uh, just uh, two comments. Um, the, um, the frontier economics point on the recovery value is of course very good for communication purposes because it's a very clear point estimate. You do that, you get that. But what we found in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in thinking about these things is, and what we heard also from investors is that it may be even more uh, welcomed by investors to actually reduce the standard deviation. Not so much the, the midpoint, you know, how much you get recovery value, but really reduce the standard deviation. It's more important to know what you get uh, than how much it is. You can work with that figure. And the, the second point, um, I think we quoted already for the second time now in, in our report, um, um, a paper that is, is quite interesting uh, because it shows how capital markets can help to address one of the main arguments against insolvency reforms that we he hear over and over again, and that is the moral hazard, right? If you make insolvency too easy, 
then uh, you will have strategic uh, default, etc. And there's this paper that we quote uh, the second time in a row, uh, by uh, Stoughton, Rheinland, and Sechner, I think, where they show with a very peculiar data set from the tourism industry that actually with, with, with the right data, uh, capital markets can be a very nice disciplining device because once they have solved the standard deviation problem, they can really give a very good uh, uh, feedback on who is defaulting strategically and who is not. And maybe, maybe this is something one can develop further, how, how capital markets uh, can really help to address one of these m major issues that comes back and back again when, when, when executive ministers of, of justice tell us, well, uh, you know, in insolvency reform, uh, difficult. Thank you. Let me take one last question here, one last for this round. Thank you. Uh, I'm João Tomás from the Portuguese Banking Association. Just a, a very quick comment. Uh, first, uh, uh, we welcome the fact that the Capital Markets Union, Union, contrary to the Banking Union, has a development uh, uh, agenda. Although we consider it important that the focus should be more on increasing overall financing and not, not so much in the question of the substitution of financing because if you look at the numbers in Europe, we would have an investment gap of over 300 billion uh, uh, estimated investment gap. There's clearly an equity gap that needs to be filled. And regarding the, the previous uh, uh, interventions, it was clear that uh, regarding, for instance, items such as securitization or money market funds, we have many issues that arose from what happened in the United States namely the, the questions of the market, money market funds breaking the buck, the problems of the losses in the securitizations, uh, and what we see in Europe, uh, uh, we have big files such as money market fund that was uh, an initial proposal by the commission in 2013 that uh, it has still uh, have not developed uh, and it had uh, uh, an initial proposal of a uh, a buffer of capital. Afterwards, the Parliament came with the idea of the uh, constant enough public debt money market funds. But I it will be difficult to conciliate some of those perspectives in, in terms of the risk re return. That is to say, when you have a negative yields, when you want to investors to invest in uh, funds that uh, account for over 38% uh, of the short-term debt by banks, it's a difficult issue to solve in terms of uh, regulation. And also regarding securitizations, we, we welcome the proposal of the uh, STS and also the capital uh, uh, calibration. But if you look at the estimates of the non-neutrality ratios after those measures, you, we can still see that the, those <coughs> ratios are too high. That is to say, and my question, to, uh, just to sum up, is from the members of the, pa the panel, what is your view in terms of the competitive advantage or disadvantage in terms of regulation in capital markets when we compare to the US? Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, let me turn back to the, to the panel. Who would like to react? Rick? Um, I can probably address maybe the, the securitization question, the, your last one first, in terms of the, the U.S. framework versus the um, European framework, at least on securitization. If you look at the investor base for the products, um, whether they're pension funds, insurance companies, banks, or other participants, um, the environment's fairly different uh, in the States than it is here. One of the big differences is insurance companies, it may sound obvious, U.S. insurance companies don't have a solvency too and the capital charges for particularly the mezzanine tranches of securitizations in Europe are really high, which are basically a non-starter for the insurance industry. Uh, in the States, it's a much different measurement, so the insurance companies are still act fairly active buyers in the States. The capital charges also for liquidity portfolios make a big difference. So one of the reasons why we've been trying to recommend looking at securitization as a whole is unless you look at the buyers and the sellers motive incentive and motivations together you'll be maybe fixing one problem but you maybe create another problem over here so um, that's why we're completely supportive of the direction that the STS is going because it does look at it as a whole thank you uh, Sean thanks Ben well maybe I come back on this agency based approach to securitization um, 
course, there are big differences between the U.S. and the EU approaches, and I think the U.S. have this agency-based approach. They've had it for a very long time. Um, I think before the crisis, this public underwriting was rather vague. We were told they were GSEs, but they were really underwritten by the state. But of course, the market assumed they were. I think this created quite a bit of moral hazard in the market. This market did balloon up to six, seven trillion, and it all ended up in a conservatorship on the balance sheet of the US state. So I think from that alone, we're not so keen on following the sort of agency-based, certainly not public agency-based uh, approach. I think in keeping with the philosophy that we have now post-crisis where government is encouraged to stay out of financial markets as far as possible, we think what the approach we have adopted with STS is one which will deliver probably a smaller market, but a market which stands on its own feet and is then probably more sustainable in the longer term. So I think uh, it is true we could have of course, we could pump prime this market if we could we put government guarantees across lots of it, but we don't think that's necessarily philosophically uh, or even uh, economically the right way to go. One of the points then on the substitution of, I mean, I think it's clear from comments up here, no, nobody's talking here about substituting capital market financing for bank financing as some kind of competition game here. This is about evolving the system. Uh, but it does raise another issue about transition versus steady state. So there's macro, micro, but there's also transition versus steady state, which is a banking union issue as well. We're going to have to start creating capital market union in a very particular environment of low interest rates, which I presume to be a transitional phase. But we'll have to target the end at the steady state. So I think the idea is not to create is to create a kind of bigger financial system where the share of banking may be smaller, but the absolute size of the banking system could very easily be bigger. I would even go one step further, uh, Sean, and saying that capital market union, if, if properly done and if done quickly enough, um, uh, will be instrumental in bringing money to, uh, to high yield projects, high yield meaning innovative growth, uh, uh, ambitious projects in the real economy, which themselves will help uh, increase real returns in the economy and, uh, and, uh, and will help uh, monetary policy come back to normal. So I think there is a positive interaction here yep. over time. Let me take a, uh, let me go for a second, uh, unless there is any other reaction, let me go for a, uh, another round of questions. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, John Account, BlackRock. Um, we're generally incredibly supportive of the capital markets union, particularly the focus on long-term sustainable assets, uh, infrastructure, uh, venture capital, investing in SMEs, uh, cross-border investments, um, because it's very good for the financial future of our clients as well as growth and, and employment. Uh, a couple of people have highlighted tax as a barrier. Sean mentioned tax in, in the context of um, private pensions. <coughs> and this morning we heard about withholding tax. Um, I wanted to flag uh, another potential very significant barrier, and I've got a question about it as well. Um, the potential unintended consequence is caused by BEPS, basis erosion profit shifting, and its implementation in Europe, the anti-tax avoidance directive. Um, totally and utterly supportive of the primary aim of BEPS, which is to stop multinationals shifting revenues around and achieving double non-taxation. But it has a big unintended consequence on investment funds because they are multinational entities and have cross-border clients and cross-border investments. And the OECD has come to some sort of solution for what they call, for, for mainstream funds, uh, USITS, AIFs, investing in equities and bonds. But there is no solution at the moment, they're still trying, but there's no solution at the moment for investment funds, cross-border investment funds, investing in infrastructure, venture capital, private equity, loan origination funds, real estate. So all of those funds that uh, um, we're hoping to spur and increase investment in infrastructure and SME investing. My question is, if the OECD doesn't come up with a solution, what can we in Europe do to allow legitimate cross-border capital allocation in these asset classes to continue. That was a secondary goal of BEPS. Uh, because Europe is, the other, other regions don't suffer to the extent as Europe. We, we are the region that has 
the greatest amount of cross-border investing and the most at stake. Thank you. One last question, if any. Mm, yes, please. Hello, thank you. Uh, my name is Sandra Hack from AOPA. So I have a question on the PEPs. You know we have uh, issued our final advice to the Commission on 1st of February on the pan-European personal pro pension product that was mentioned favorably here a lot of times. So this is about the standardization, raising economies of scales, making a um, cost-efficient uh, personal pension product here, which still has a high level of consumer protection, which is very important for us. Looking at the numbers of who is investing actually in what we have in mind when we talk about the capital markets union being SME loans and so forth, um, I'm wondering whether we target the wrong provider of this PEP because, I mean, so far we have uh, the in sectors very much attracted by this is insurers, asset managers, less so banks. What are your thoughts on that? Okay, thank you very much. So who's, who wants to comment on either tax and or pensions. Yes, uh, Guillaume? Um, on on uh, taxation, I'm not a, a, an expert, but I think uh, uh, your point makes sense, huh, that uh, there should not be uh, a discrimination or a multiple taxation of funds, uh, even if they invest in non-transferable securities, so such uh, as venture capital funds, etc. That's contrary, contrary to the objective of the CMU. On uh, the question on the PEP, um, I think I said, uh, except for, for some point, I think it's a very well designed proposal from AOPA. And one of the good things, I think, is that it is open to uh, multiple types of providers, as you said, uh, asset managers, insurers, banks. And uh, I think it's a key part of the uh, success uh, of this product. It should not be uh, limited to one category of uh, providers. Thank you, uh, Guillaume. Uh, Rick? Um, yeah, I, I would agree. Um, one of the things we're finding as part of our SME research is that particularly at the early stage, the pre-IPO stage, for example, which Deutsche Börse and, and other major exchanges are actively looking through for their venture program, which we're very, very supportive of, a good program. Um, there's about six stages of funding that most SMEs go through before they get big enough to go to a Deutsche Bourse or other exchange. A pension fund, if it's sufficiently flexible, could have the capacity to invest in small bits of equity. It doesn't necessarily need to be that vehicle, but it could be other vehicles. For example, lots of, uh, for example, business angel equity, from what we understand, is actually made through companies rather than through pensions. So I think at the smallest level, there needs to be a broad approach, again, after not looking at this as a silo, to say what are the different motivations and incentives for people to invest, either companies or individuals, in small bits of equity, and have them hang on to it sufficiently long to let the companies grow. Thank you. Um, let me give the last word to Sean on BEPS and investment funds, or, or any other issue? Well, on BEPS, I'm reluctant to commit to this because I start swimming out of my, uh, out of my water here. This is a, an issue which is handled primarily by another department, but we are aware of the problem. It has, you have made us aware of the problem. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so we are working with our taxation department to see what we can do. The thing is, as you said, the, the o, this is an OECD-sponsored approach. We like it because it's global. So it's being adopted at global level. So we will try as far as possible, I think, to find a solution within the OECD rather than having to break out into a European one. If it doesn't come, we have to think again. But our preference is to work with the OECD to, to find a way uh, around this consequence. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. Let me uh, thank very warmly all the uh, participants in the panel. Thank you for coming. Um, there is no formal uh, closing of this conference, so and uh, I'm not uh, I'm not uh, wrapping up the, the day. So uh, let me just thank uh, all uh, all participants, uh, uh, all um, uh, also uh, the audience for your questions. Uh, we'll have the the next conference uh, next year, presumably around the same time in Brussels uh, at the Commission, uh, and I'm quite certain we'll uh, discuss the achievements uh, in implementing a capital market union. Thank you very much.